we have not much time left and um, we cannot bring everything from statistical learning now which with which we start now but we want to start to get you back into this and to give you some time to think about this statistics has been lurking around all the time in machine learning we haven't done this explicitly by now but we have used your basic understanding and what we now do is to recap more formally and precisely the terms and notions and definitions that we need this all prepares for base classification and base classification is a special case of subjectivism this is a certain branch or approach to think about probabilities and um, it is said this, that machine learning has its basic gist rooted in subjectivism and what this means um, i will give you a bit of idea in this reading and i will not overstrain this today we will close in time and we will continue then next week and of course if you have questions in between please ask them it might be the case that you know all these terms this is um, in fact rather likely but if you had to give a precise definition you would not be able to do this and hence a recap does make sense it does also make sense to to learn how we explain this and um, let me tell it again machine learning is has its root in statistics and you we need you to have a good understanding about this we will recap the following definitions what is a random experiment what are events? How should we define probability? What are likelihoods and prior probabilities, which we need for base? And what are conditional probabilities and the independence of events? You see, you have all heard these terms, and we will now read. First, I will start with an arrangement explanation where the topics come from. We have mathematics. Part of mathematics is stochastics, and part of stochastics is probability theory. And from this, we need probability measures and Kolmogorov. Statistics also covers the inferential statistics, that means hypothesis tests, variance analysis histograms, principal component analysis. This is something we will not cover in this course. It, it is necessary uh, for certain experiments and evaluations, but we will not cover this. And at the outer range, you see machine learning, where in the form of data mining and anom um, anomaly detection or cluster analysis belongs also somehow to statistics. However, what we today need and go to and we need for base is this. A random experiment is a trial for which we have a procedure which at least theoretically can be repeated infinite times. The procedure is clearly defined this is called configuration. For instance, if you toss a dice or if you toss a coin or roll a dice, then you exactly explain what you are doing. It is also interesting to see or clear to, for us that the outcome is unpredictable. If this were not the case, we would not have something like random. A random experiment is also jumping out of the window and looking what happens. Don't look at random experiments only in this clear and easy Laplace setting, which I will explain later on. Random experiments happen all the day. If random experiments are initiated by the nature, we call them natural random experiments. For us, the weather is a natural random experiment.
the randomness with in some experiment is something which might change if we gain knowledge because also random experiments are causal in the sense of cause and effect. It means if we get background knowledge about a certain process, its randomness might vanish. Hence, a former random experiment might turn into a deterministic process if you get new insights. It might also be the case that if you look at this dog exchange, for you, there's something what you see is not a random experiment, but for your friends, it is. And here comes the so-called subjectivism. You see no random, others see random, and hence you get other assessments. And this is very important to understand this. This subjectivism cannot be explained with frequencies. No worries, I will go into this a bit now. We needed first some definitions. We have a set omega, which is called sample space. And this omega collects all experiment outcomes. If we have such a sample space, we call each subset A of omega an event. An event occurs if the experiment outcome, small omega, is a member of the event. The set of all events, the power set of omega, is called event space. As an example, if you're rolling a dice, the sample space is comprised of all numbers that we can observe. And some event is some subset of this. The power set of omega has that many, that means exponential number of events in the size of the sample space. This event occurs, the event A with two, four, and six, if one of its numbers is observed. For instance, if you roll a four, the event, which we might call an even roll, occurred. If you roll two dice at the same time, you get two numbers at the same time. Hence, in omega, I have packed these two numbers into sets. It means I'm not interested in the order of its elements. Altogether, this set omega has six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one elements. I guess this is um, 21. If I roll two dice, one after the other, I might be interested in the order. There's a first outcome and a second outcome. And this is not a subtle, this is a big difference. Here you see a vector. And the outcome one, two is different from the outcome two, one. And if I want to capture the same event like before, I have to list both outcomes. Okay. Here are important event types. You know all this. The impossible event which never happens. The certain event which always happens. When rolling a dice, it always happens that you get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. There's a complementary event, sometimes called opposite event. The elementary event, which has only one elementary outcome. This here is important to understand this. 
some events. I give you an example for this. Role a two is a sub event of the event even number of role. This means from two follows two or five, uh, sorry, or four or six. We say two entails an even number of roles. Don't think conversely that two or four or six entails two because you see here a bigger set on the right hand side. No, this is wrong. Two entails this one. That means if A is a sub event of B, A entails B. If two events are incompatible, their respective sets have no member in common. But what does it mean that something happens with a certain probability? How do we describe this? What do we think about if somebody says with a certain probability, this election will be run by this party. With a certain probability, the stock exchange will go down. It's a certain probability and, and, and. In fact, to give a, a bit polarizing, but uh, somehow helpful answer is to say, in fact, nobody knows what probabilities are. And hence all approaches to capture this finally failed. There are a few things which left over and I will burn them today. For instance, the classical definition, if you have a setup, which is very easy to understand, which is easy to understand because of its physics, its mechanism. If you roll a dice, you know from the physics of the cube that the cube has six um, outer sides and it can only land on one side and you see the opposite side and hence you can directly say something. We also learned, this is the second thing, that if you repeat a certain procedure time by time, then you find some collating of observations, some frequency in certain areas. But finally, we have to admit that Different things that might happen get different assessments from different people. And I have it written in brackets here, the axiomatic probability. This is a fantastic solution. It was invented in 1933 by Kolmogorov. It's not an explanation to probability, but only a means to compute them. And hence, this is so successful. The computation rules are used in the approaches which are also mentioned above. Hence, I have written this also in parentheses. And you should understand the three different approaches to capture probability because all are used. And you should understand if you discuss something with a person, what is his or her understanding of probability in that moment. The classical so-called Laplace probability in this regard is perhaps the easiest. It was developed in the mid age when people had these gambling uh, games and gambling situations. And it's simply defined as the number of favorable cases to the number of possible cases. For instance, if you roll a dice, six outcomes are possible and uh, one is only there and then you get to this probability. People wanted to build the whole probability theory upon this, but this is simply not possible because this is written here. You should also keep this in your mind. Probability, the plus probability as introduced here is a circular definition. 
the probability of Laplace always requires to talk about some physical mechanics, which leads to the concept of equal probability. A random experiment whose configuration and procedure imply equal, equal probable sample space is called Laplace experiment. And you see, probability is explained by probability. This does not really help. However, it is quite useful to see this as an experiment as a Laplace experiment. The frequentism is, of course, very useful and popular. We observe, if we repeat something very often, that we have a certain, yeah, limit is not the correct word. Uh, we, we get a certain expected value and the larger the number of trials is, the closer we get to this. Yeah. For instance, if you roll a dice, um, let's say infinite number of times or close to this, and the probability for a certain outcome will be one over six. The terminus technicus for this is the empirical law of large number or large numbers. And it was very enticing for mathematicians to think about or develop a limit law like we have this um, topology, if we are talking about fields and epsilon delta environments. But this is not possible. We cannot observe infinite, infinite number of experiments. We cannot develop small epsilon environments about experiments which contain infinite number of experiments. And so, limit concept does not carry the idea of probability altogether. We have only the observation that if we do something very often, there comes some kind of stability. Again, this is called the empirical law of large numbers. The third approach is the so-called subjectivism. And this leads us also to base rule later on, which we will discuss and apply probably in the next reading. The subjectivism is gaining more and more interest also in daily statistics. And sometimes it was a fight of frequentists against subjectivists, but they need each other. You cannot say I'm only a frequentist. You need subjectivism because there are events which we cannot repeat infinite number of times. For instance, will the next, the first travel to Mars be a success? What will we do with frequentism to answer such a question? We cannot do this. Will Biden continue with the America first politics like uh, Trump does? We cannot know this. And here we have to assess different opinions. And this is called subjectivism. And how this is done um, is a bit explained in this formula, which you see here. We have some data. We have hypothesis about the data. And we combine these by multiplying the so-called likelihood times the prior probability. I give you an example. Let's say you are walking down the street and observe um, a damaged car. <clears throat> the data is then the car is damaged. Let's simply say this. You start reasoning about how this happened. And um, you have seen Armageddon in the evening and you are thinking, Perhaps it was a meteorite who did this. And um, you're thinking about other possibilities. It could also be a hailstorm. 
Then we know, and now the interesting thing comes, the probability of damage under meteorite, if the meteorite hits the car, is certain. That means the likelihood, how accurate does the hypothesis explain the data, this is really high. Hail does not always damage a car. So, in about, you can read insurance companies' reports about 20%. However, the prior probability of meteorite is something around this. And the prior probability of hail is something like this. And if you multiply them, given the data, the damaged car and your hypothesis, you will find out that hail is the so-called maximum a posteriori result decision probability, like you want to call this. This is the gist of subjectivism, what I explain to you here. And this is not an, uh, an imprecise theory, this is a very precise theory. And um, in fact, you already did this all your life. And here we bring this back to finally bring you base rule and base classifiers, the base optimum classifiers, and to understand maximum a posteriori probabilities and hypothesis versus maximum likelihood probabilities, which come from the frequentists. This is not so easy, although the formulas are not complicated. The, the, to understand this, get a feeling for this is not so easy. I'm struggling with this my whole life in statistics. Mm, what we should uh, take from here is that we do not need um, this here um, in the denominator because it is a constant for all multiplications or products in the numerator. This reads as the probability for hypothesis under data is proportional to the likelihood times prior. You can read a bit in the remarks if it goes too quickly. I will bring the last approach for today. It's not approach to understand probability. It's an approach, as I already said, only to compute its probabilities. And this solved a big, big problem. The axiomatic approach to something is the following. You do not understand what happened. You do not want to understand what's happening. You simply postulate a certain function and specify required properties in relation with probabilities, this means we postulate a function that assigns something which we call probability without understanding to each element of our event space. Let's see, you know, consider the event space, uh, rolling a dice, it, we have, these are all subsets from one to six. And you assign a number to each of these 36 elements or something like this. And then you say this function has certain properties. Here are these properties. Kolmogorov brought this. And this is so simple. It looks so simple that it is quickly underestimated. But this was a big breakthrough. It did took 250 years to develop these three observations. We have the sample space, we have the event space clear, and now we are talking about the function. And the function only needs to have three properties. For each element of the event space, it should 
bring a number which is larger than zero. For the argument of the sample space, it should deliver a one. And if two events do not share an element, we say that we combine the probabilities of event A union unified with event B as a simple addition. On these three axioms, all on computation of probabilities are built. And you, you have to admit, this, this looks very easy. It was not. Having this, we can work with probabilities with, without interpreting them. We don't need to know what does it mean in 30% of our cases this happens, or it is very likely that this happens. We simply take numbers and compute them. And the interpretation is left, completely left to ourselves as a private decision. The definition six, I jumped over it quickly, does not bring something new. It only tells if we have a Z omega and um, if we have an event space, we call the triple or the tuple, and depends on the definition. There are a bit divergent in the, in the literature. We call this triple this um, probability measure or this tuple here a probability space. And all stories start with, uh, with the sentence we are giving a probability space. And then you, you know what it is. Benno, quick question from the chat. Yeah, sorry. Um, are we assuming that the sample space is finite? Yes, we are doing it at the moment. Yeah. And it is, uh, it's not a necessary restriction. It is broken um, in, in mass theory and uh, measure theory of mathematics, but this goes far, far beyond this, what we are doing. And it's in fact not necessary. Um, and this is also to do with the definition of random variables, which are built upon these ideas here. And uh, no a short question again, find it. Mm, however, we can stop here at this point. I don't want to overstrain um, the time. I don't want to overstrain your strain your patience and. Um, Beck, I want that you capture these things and, and think about this. A random experiment, you can jump out of the window 10 times and measure what happens. Yes, the outcome is unpredictable. Yes, the a sample space, possible outcomes, event space, a subset of this. Three approaches to understand and interpret probability, Laplace, frequentism, and subjectivism, you need them all. And an uh, approach to compute probabilities, the three axioms from Kolmogorov, which lead to the probability space. That's all from my side for today. Next week, we will directly continue with conditional events and conditional probabilities, and then have everything together to develop base rule. And this is not so difficult then to develop the NARC base classifier, which does interesting jobs and is quite powerful in certain situations. Thank you for listening, and that's all from my side for now.